speaker will be uh, Liu Bo Chen, he's a senior engineer uh, at Twitter. And today he will be talking to talking us about uh, how they are basically integrating Janus in Periscope for, for some, some cool things. So uh, please, looking forward to your talk. Thanks. So what is Periscope? Periscope is Twitter's interactive live video streaming app, which is available on Android, iOS, and web. So using Periscope, you can broadcast live video and interact with the people via hearts and text comments. Also, you can watch popular live videos all over the world. You can search broadcast by location or by topic. So you can instantly share your live video into Twitter. And if you missed some live video, you can watch the replay. The best part is just by replay the broadcast. And the best of all of it is free, right? So this graph shows how the media flows from the broadcaster to viewers. So when a broadcaster tries to broadcast, you will talk to the API service to create a broadcast object. And then it streams its live video to our media ingest back end server. It's called Feedman, which represents video manager. And Feedman transmarks its the RTMT streams for distribution to the viewers using HLS protocol together with our own first in low latency HLS protocol. So the media content are saved into TS files together with playlist. It is saved into Redis to support live playback and it is saved into S3 to support replay of the broadcast. So when the viewer wants to watch the broadcast, it talks to the API service first to get broadcast information, including the master playlist file name. And then it tried to download the master playlist from our MOS service, MOS, its media origin service. And then based on its own bandwidth and other conditions, it, it chooses the right variant and send a request to Morse and further to our transcode service. We are supporting the multiference. We are transcoding the video on the fly to support multiference instead of saving. So as you know, this backend service is developed on top of AWS, Amazon AWS. We are taking advantage of the elastic load balancer for load balance and TLS of loading. And if you are familiar with AWS service, probably you're wondering why do we need a Feedman shot keeper here as ELB does support long life TCP uh, load balancing. So the reason is we are trying to be fair and nice to our users. If we are using ELB, it has a one hour cap for connection training when you deploy updating software. And for us, we are trying to extend this to up to 24 hours or even longer. So in this architecture, the broadcaster interacts with viewers only by hearts and text comments. It's very limited. So motivated by Twitter's goal to get to the public to converse as much as possible. So we are trying to think, in, right? As you can think, in, we are thinking if we can get the viewers involved in the broadcast to allow them calling. So it may be some interesting that we, something we can do. 
And so we have been extending this architecture to support a handout style broadcast. So as you can imagine, right, if we want to add Janus, where it should go in this architecture? So it should go right between the broadcaster and our Figman ELB. So that's where Janus should go. So the architecture for the Janus is very similar to our media ingest backend like Figman. We have Janus server. In front of Janus server, we put a WebRTC gateway used for all the API authentication. And we have a WebRTC gateway shard keeper, uh, which is kind of a same reason we want to introduce this shard keeper. So I will talk them uh, one by one. So Janus container setup. So Janus is a third party open source project written in C. And it opens like UDP and TCP ports to the public. So we do have very special requirements for the security. It needs to be isolated from the other service on the same host. So that's the reason, especially, it's a lot allowed to access our metadata service who manages our secrets to access Redis and S3. So that's the reason the network mode for this Janus Docker container needs to be set in bridge mode instead of host mode. So that's the reason we have a parameter, the port mapping. We open the 300 UDP ports and TCP ports, totally 600 ports. And another parameter we pass to this genus is we enabled the STCP supports as at the start. We don't have the turn setup yet. So, so we think since Janus does support this TCP, let's enable it. Unfortunately, that caused a lot of pain to us. So the very first pain is that we are using nibnice 0.13. So which does not release TCP ports when a video room is destroyed. So after each video room, a TCP port is occupied. So after 300 video rooms, no more TCP ports available. So ice fails for everyone. So we solve this problem by upgrading DeepNice to the latest version. Right now we are using the master at Fabular 7, I think, on oh, Fabular 7. And even with the latest DeepNice, we have another issue with the CPU usage spiking. As you can see from our dashboard, so before July 9th, you can see the CPU usage in all the 12 regions is easily spiked to 60%. And after July 9th, it magically drops to 20%. So you can guess what happens, right? I disable the TCP support. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm talking about why do we need WebRTC Gateway? Actually, as I already mentioned, Genesis is a third party open source project. It is not allowed to access our metadata service on the same host. So that's the reason we need to put a WebRTC gateway in front of each genus to do the API authentication check. So the WebRTC gateway simply acts as a HTTP proxy to genus. So it checks all the HTTP requests if it's valid, then it forward to Janus and everything is done. So here is an example of the API tokens we used for authentication check. So using this JSON object, you can check if the protocol is allowed, if this token is granted to the user who is trying to use it, 
or the broadcast role, if you are a guest, you are not allowing to create a video room at all. So now I talk about the Shockkeeper, WebRTC Shockkeeper. And why do we need it? Actually, I already talked about it. So the role for this Shockkeeper is forwarding the HTTP request to the same video room, to the same genus instance. And we are trying to be nice to our users, so we want to extend, we want to keep it open uh, TCP or HTTP connection for up to like 24 hours instead of one hour connection draining cap. So that's the reason we put the shut keeper here. And how it works. So we do have a table, it's a dynamo DB table. We call it WebRTC gateway lock table. So it plays a very important role to implement this shop keeper functionality. So when a WebRTC gateway instance starts, it tries to register itself in this table and lock a shard ID by itself and register that. So when the broadcaster when a broadcaster tries to create a broadcast or API service will scan this table and choose the list of video rooms on this instance for load balancing. So in this case, it will choose shard ID 14 and return this shard ID to the broadcaster and all the guests who wants to join this broadcast. So then all their requests will be forwarded to the same instance with shard ID 14. So in this case, so when a WebRTC instance dies, so it will fail to update the timestamp. So the timestamp becomes expired. We have, we always have one more extra WebRTC instance in each region, which keeps scanning this table. So when it finds there is a expired timestamp, time it will replace it, register itself. So then keep serving. Now I talk about uh, our own little protocol, which forwards streams to Feedman. We are not using the RTP forwarder. Instead, we develop our own version. It's called Hydro Forward because it needs to be compatible with our current media ingest backend service Feedman. So each video room, we just open one TCP socket into our feed, feedman and it forwards all the streams including RTP, RTCP and our own state packets uh, into the same TCP socket. And feedman will transmark the streams into HLS and low latency HLS and delivers to viewers. So on the left is the hydro protocol header. So we sent this header once only once when the TCP connection is open. And on the right is the packet header. We attach this header for each of the RTP or RTCP and state packet. So this is Janus in operation. So we have a dashboard to monitor how it behaves in all the 12 regions. For example, on the left is how many video rooms uh, that is currently active and how many audio video broadcasters and how many audio only publishers we have right this moment. So from this graph, you say, hey, we don't have so many, but actually we are serving more than 100K broadcast daily using Janus right now. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Lubo. Uh, uh, let's give a warm round of applause for Lubo. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions from Lubo on the presentation? Hey, Lubo, thanks a lot for sharing. 
Um, a few slides back, I, I believe I read that you do not uh, allow access to see applications. Ah, there we go. Uh, to see applications to the metadata service. Uh, I was just curious. Um, do you have like a blessed list of languages or frameworks or something that you do allow to access this? Uh, basically, this res restriction applies to the containers network mode. So our platform setup requires, for example, if, if you want access the metadata service, so all the containers, if you are using a host mode, you are allowed to access the metadata service. But for Genus, it is a lot now, so we cannot set it into like host mode. We have to put it into bridge mode. Ah, I see. So it's not necessarily tied to the fact that Janus is written in C. And we are especially concerned about C, right? It overflows easily. Yeah, I see, <laughs> I see. But if it were written in, in Rust, for instance, would you be okay with it? Uh, all our service currently in Go, so if you're in Go, probably it's fine. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, good to know. Thanks for sharing. Any other question? I should have written Jano Singo, damn. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the presentation. And I was wondering, I saw on one of the slides that you use RTMP from the broadcaster, and I was wondering why RTMP and uh, why HLS, why HTTP streaming? Oh, this is, is the original architecture for Periscope's backend service for the ingest site. Ah, before Janus or? Right, before Janus was uh -huh. introduced. Okay, okay. Thanks. There's a question there. Hi, Lubo. You said that your containers are using the bridge mode of the Docker, right? right? Can you tell? Can you please clarify why you have to use the bridge networking mode, and you cannot rely? I quite get why you cannot use the host mode, but for instance, why are not you thinking to assign dedicated IP addresses to your containers? Uh, so basically, as I said, right, our platform setup allows all the containers in host mode to access our metadata service, which manages our credentials, like to access Redis and S3. So that's the reason for Janus. Oh, OK, so you want to avoid that. Right. OK, got it. And Thank actually, you. platform is, keeps working on it since we are complaining about this bridge mode. And have you ever used bridge mode? So for each port we open, right, there is a doc Docker proxy process is spawned to manage the port. So we are opening 600 ports, which means we have 600 Docker proxy processes running on the instance. So if you want to open more, which means more processes are running there. Yeah, I know. I'm giving a talk about this later today, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Platform uh, is is still working on it, trying to get rid of this, so to support host mode. Uh, any more questions for Liubo? Okay, then let's give Liubo one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all.